Welcome to a first of a multi-part series in which I will try to create a goer track using most of the methods that we used back in the day. So back in the mid 90s when all the classic goal was created. And by that I mean not having 200 tracks and 100 automation lanes, you know, and 20 effects on each channel, etc. I want to keep it very, very basic and restrict myself to a handful of synths and also very limited automation. So I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. First of all, though, I need to create my virtual studio. In my mind, I'm using a, a mixer that was commonly used back then, which is a Mackie 328. It doesn't matter that it's a Mackie. It just, I know that that was a very common mixer. Um, essentially, it's a 32 channel mono desk with eight sends, eight FX sends. So that means essentially that I'm restricted to 32 mono channels and just a handful or eight FX units. I can use a couple more effects as inserts, but I'm going to not go crazy with that. I'm thinking maybe one or two. Back in the day, we didn't have 20 hardware effects. There were maybe five or six. So even if I go with 10 or 12, even that's quite a lot. But the effects will be in the next episode. The first episode today is creating the studio and also maybe we'll get some kick and bass and maybe some percussion down also. I will run you through the studio that I have. I'm using a SH-101. In this case, I'm using the TAL baseline. I'm using a TR-909 TR for percussion. In this case, I'm using Audio Realism's ADM. The ubiquitous TB303. The Nord Lead, which is, in this case, the Disco DSP Discovery Pro. The ARP2600, Juno 106, and MS20 are from Cherry Audio. And then the sampler that I'm using is just Groove Agent, which is the default Cubase one. I have it named S5000 because that's the hardware sampler that I have. Um, it doesn't make a difference, you know, it's just something that's familiar with me. It just makes the project fun, if you like. You'll notice that there are only eight instruments here. That is because the TR-909 was multi-timbral. So I have that split out into well, snare, open hat and closed hat, and crash are on separate channels. And then I have a spare so I haven't used that yet. Let's see what that will be. The 303 is mono. That's fine. The Nord lead is four channel multi-timbral. So we have layer A, B, C, and D. So that's four mono channels. 2600 is mono. The Juno 106 is stereo in hardware. That takes up two of the mixer channels. MS20 is mono. And then the... The S5000 is 16 channel multi timbral, so that is split out into 16 channels here. Well, in this case, actually, I did 15. The reason being is because, as I said above, the Juno 106 is stereo, so I had to restrict that by one to ensure that I'm still only showing, well, I'm making sure that I'm showing 31 channels which is essentially 32 after you consider the Juno 106 is stereo, if that makes sense. So I'm not cheating. I'm restricting myself to 32 channels. Another rule that I am using is that these synths can only be used once. So for example, I'm about to do the kick drum and I'll be using the SH-101 for that, but then I'll also be wanting to use the 101 for the bass line. So that means that I will need to sample out that kick so then I can free up that 101 again. The other final restriction that I'm placing on myself is automation. Um, given I only have two hands, I can only really automate two bits of hardware at once. 
So there will only be two lanes of automation or two parameters automated simultaneously in this project. On each of the channels, I have, well, I have Pro Q3, but before you accuse me of cheating, that's really just for visual. I'm, I'm definitely not going to use any of the, the EQ on that. I do, however, have a SSL 4000 channel strip. Ideally, I'd like to use a Mackie one, but I don't believe that there is such a thing. So I'm just using a SSL. So without further ado, let's create the kick. I am going to mute the three Cherry Audio synths because I'm just using demos of them for now. So they're randomly popping up white noise. So you'll see that green. So let's create the kick then. The kick is essentially just a self-resonating filter in a 101. You can most likely hear a click at the end. I'm not too worried about that because as I said, I will sample this kick out and then tidy that up in the sampler. So ignore that. So that sounds quite good for now. So that's render or I should say record. Now let's put it into our sampler. Okay. Let's remove this now that we've used that. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a group called kick. Now do note that I'm not creating another channel in my mixer. All I'm doing is essentially rerouting this kick. At the moment it's going to project out Instead, I'm sending it to kick, and then the kick here is going to go to project out. 
So instead of seeing the output here, you will now see it up there, hopefully. Well, it's still coming out here, but there's no output. It's just visually here. The sound is coming out of this one. The only reason for doing that is because then I can keep the kick and bass together up here. That's purely just a workflow. It's not cheating or adding another track, etc. Now let's create the bass line. This was the kick, so let's initialize that again, load default. To remember that the MIDI wasn't sequenced back then, it was mostly, where possible, done via MIDI clock. The SH-101 was synced via CV, or CV and gate, I should say, using the internal sequencer. So we need to use this internal sequencer down here rather than programming the MIDI notes. So let's see what we can come up with. First, I'll create the general tone and then we'll go and do a, a sequence. Well, first I'll put in straight 16 so we can hear something. So that will do for now, just for the sound. We want something really subby. Uh, do keep in mind that don't, the same with a kick, you know, it's a goer kick. So don't expect the production quality of a full on or a forest track. That just simply wasn't possible back in the day. So the goer kick had its own unique sound. And then the bass line, it's, um, there wasn't functionality such as phase reset or, you know, crystal clean envelopes. It was, it was analog. So it was, um, gritty and dirty and it moved a lot and that's what gave it its charm. So now we'll get into doing this sequence. Let's take off the the first, fifth, ninth, and thirteenth to make room for the kick.
So let's go with that for now. I might change it later. So now let's do some percussion with the trusty 909. Again, it was all using the internal sequencer. We do have the option to sample that out later, should we want. But for now, let's just keep it in the machine itself. Let's solo that. Snare first. Let's just check they're coming out the correct outputs. Snare, open hat, perfect. Now let's do the closed. I might do so now we created the kick group before I will move the 101 up there create a new folder called kick and bass kick and bass go into there and just because I like to keep things clean, let's kick and base in my projects is always this cyan color. Which I have it set to a hotkey, which works on group channels and individual channels, but for some reason it doesn't work on on folder tracks. Annoyingly. So there, so we have the kick and the bass and the basic percussion down. In the next episode, I think we'll look at the leads and maybe the 303. The 303 is always fun, so let's do that next. But for now, this is what we have, just a very basic start. Thanks very much, and... We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.